There's a famous monk in Thailand, back in the early part of the 20th century, Kruba Siwi Chai. Well known all over northern Thailand. And he sponsored many construction projects. Lots of temples were built, bridges were built. Even the road up to Doi Satape was built by volunteer labor under his direction. And someone once asked him, why was it that all the projects he set his mind to succeeded? He says, because he chanted the Mahasamaya Sutta every day, three times a day. The Davis liked hearing it. Back in my early years in Thailand, I happened to hear that story. Mentioned it to a John Fuang. We were about to build a jetty at the monastery. And so he asked me to chant the Mahasamaya every day, and he chanted it every day. And even though at that point he was into his sixties, he was able to memorize it. And it became the basic chant at the monastery. The theory being that the Devas like to hear their names mentioned, and that's what the Mahasamaya is. It's a list of all the Devas who came to hear the Buddha one night. He said almost all the Devas in the universe were there. Nothing much happens. It's just a list of who came, except that at one point the Garudas are coming, and they see the Nagas are there, and so they're about to swoop down. But then the Buddha forges a truce between the Nagas and the Garudas. So the Nagas like to hear this as well. It's one of the things we can think about in terms of the recollection of the devas. It's one of those meditation exercises that very few people practice. But it's a useful meditation to practice for several reasons. One, it reminds us of the possibilities that are out there. It happens that when people meditate, they have visions. Beings sometimes come in the visions. And if you had an impoverished cosmology like we tend to have here in the West, you would either think that you were going crazy, or this was an agent of the devil, or this was an angel. It turns out there are a lot more possibilities than just that. There are all kinds of beings out there. And on the one hand, you don't want to show any of them disrespect, because if it turns out there really is a being, say you're out in the forest, and these beings appear, you want to treat them with respect, you want to treat them with good courtesy. But you don't have to regard them as a force of evil, and you don't have to regard them as reliable guides. This is another area where the Buddha follows the middle path. Because just because somebody is a spirit doesn't mean they know what they're talking about. And just because you can't figure out where they're coming from doesn't mean that they're evil. So it's good to think this, keep this point in mind. One of the amazing features of a John Munn is that he had to rediscover the practice, in many cases almost all on his own, out in the forest. And he had a lot of these visions, a lot more than his teacher at John Sao. And he realized it wasn't that he was anyhow a better meditator than a John Sao, it's just that he had these particular problems, and he regarded them as problems, but also as potentials. Because they tell stories of how in his visions he would see Davis and they would come and they would teach him the Dharma, tell him how he should practice, where he was lacks in his observance of the rules where he could be more precise. For example, there's one account where he was doing walking meditation, and Davis appeared to him and said, Now, when you're doing walking meditation, don't gaze around. Look at the scenery. You're supposed to be focusing on your mind. So try to keep your gaze controlled. And he reflected that that was a good instruction. 
And this is the important point about those visions, or how he handled those visions, was that he accepted everything he was told. Or if he saw in the vision, then he would take it and test it, and consider it whether it really was a useful principle in training the mind. It made him more scrupulous, made him more precise. In those ways, the, the visions were a good thing. But it wasn't the case that he accepted everything that came in every vision. And John Fuhan was another teacher who tended to have a lot of visions. and He mentioned one time that John Munn said, when you have a vision, one, it's your private affair. You can talk about it with your teacher, but you don't want to go talking about it with other people. And secondly, you have to analyze it to see what kind of Dharma lesson is being taught in the vision. And then you have to analyze it further to figure out whether that Dharma lesson is useful. Which is the same principle that we use with everything in the practice. You read a passage in the texts, and there's no 100% guarantee that everything in the Pali Canon was said by the Buddha. And so I have to test it. And he himself encouraged us to test the teachings. His instructions to go to me, his stepmother, his instructions to Ubali, the monk who was expert in Vinaya, boil down to the fact that if you want to figure out what really is Dharma and what really is Vinaya, you have to look at what kind of behavior it encourages, what are the results of the behavior that it encourages. And you find that if it induces more passion and makes you hard for other people to support, gets you entangled with other people, then it's not Dharma, it's not Vinaya. If it leads to dispassion, to being content, to being unburdensome, that's Dharma, that's Vinaya. So whatever comes up in your meditation, even if it's just an idea, a voice in your head, or there's a vision that comes along with it, whatever comes up has to be tested. And as for other visions that don't pass the test, we just let them go. If anybody appears in the vision, you treat them with respect, you treat them with good courtesy, wish them goodwill. And this is a good habit to develop anyhow. When any vision, say, of a member of your family, an old friend, anybody that you've had dealings with appears in your meditation, wish that person goodwill, regardless of what your history is with that person. If it's a stranger that appears in your meditation, wish that person goodwill. It's a good habitual practice to develop. Another aspect of recollection of the Davis, the Buddha recommends for people observing the Ubosita precepts. You realize this Ubosita this Ubosita that we practice, the eight precepts that lay people observe on the full moon and new moon and half moon days. Those are among the practices that lead to heaven. Virtue is one of the qualities that makes a person a deva. You can think about that in two terms. One is making your deva after you die, and two, making your deva while you're here now. In other words, lifting the quality of your mind. The other four qualities are conviction. In other words, conviction in the Buddha's awakening. And that doesn't mean just conviction in the fact that the Buddha was awakened, but also in the way he awakened, how he did it. by questioning his mind and examining his mind to see what was skillful and what was unskillful, and having the heedfulness to try to develop what was skillful and abandon what was not. And that relentless cross-questioning that he imposed on himself to root out any unskillful behavior, any attachments, that's how he gained his awakening. And having conviction in that means, of course, that that's the path that you want to follow, too.
Look at your behavior carefully. Do it with a sense of compassion, do it with a sense of honesty, and you're sure to benefit. The conviction here is also conviction in the principle that you can develop what's skillful and you can demand what's unskillful. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha emphasized over and over again the idea that strict determinism, the idea that everything that you experience has already been determined by the past, is a very unskillful teaching. The irony, of course, is that nowadays many people think that the Buddha's teaching on karma is deterministic. But he went to great pains to say no. He tells the monks many times about his encounters with the Jains, his encounters with other deterministic teachers, and how he step by step by step refuted their teachings. And I don't know of any other visits of the Buddha to other teachers that he recounts in the same way. He would emphasize again and again and again that determinism is not the way things work. As he says, this practice would be totally pointless if everything were predetermined by the past. So conviction also focuses on the principle that the principle that you can develop what's skillful and abandon what's not. Another quality is generosity. Again, this is the beginning of right view, is that there is what is given, which sounds almost too obvious to state. But you have to remember back in the time of the Buddha that the principle of generosity was a controversial one. The Brahmins had been saying that generosity is fruitful, but you had to give it to the Brahmins for it to bear fruit. And so there are other contemplative schools that said, well, no, it doesn't really bear any fruit at all, because people, again, have, their behavior is either totally determined by the past or they just get snuffed out after death, there's nothing left over. And so it doesn't really matter what you do, whether you're generous or not. So when the Buddha asserted at the very beginning of mundane right view that generosity exists, that what it is given exists, he was, making, he was making two statements. One is that we do have freedom of choice, and secondly, that our actions really are fruitful. There's a long-term benefit that comes from giving, whether it's giving material things, giving your time, giving your energy. Giving is good. A third quality is learning. It means listening to the Dharma, reading the Dharma. And this is especially important in modern culture because there's so much in modern culture that goes against the Dharma. And they have so many ways of sneaking their message into your head. All those commercial jingles that seem to be jingling and jangling around your head when you're meditating. They were designed to do just that, to get stuck into your nerves. Well, the basic principle of advertising, which is that true happiness is impossible to find, so you better find your happiness with the stuff that we're selling. It takes a strong effort not to give in to these messages. And that's why it's important to listen to the Dharma frequently, to read the Dharma, to do the best you can to understand it. Again, reading these things doesn't mean just believing them. You think about them, you contemplate them, you question them, and then you try to put them into practice and see what results. But the essential mes message is the same all the way through, that how you develop your mind is of utmost importance. The important things in the world are not what someone else is doing someplace else. It's what you're doing right here, right now. And this leads to the fifth quality of the devas, which is discernment. Now, not all devas are, again, reliable guides 
all the way along the path. But they have to have at least some discernment, at least some insight into what's skillful and what's not, in order to get what they, where they are. And so this is a good reminder that discernment really is important, seeing clearly what works and what doesn't work, seeing clearly how cause and effect are connected, seeing clearly how things arise and pass away in the mind. So you can get a sense of what's connected, what's not, what's a cause, what's an effect, and then how you can focus on the causes of suffering so you can put an end to the suffering. All that is an important principle. But again, you have to look in your own mind to learn these things. You can't depend on the Davis to teach you. You look in the canon, there's some interesting stories. There's one Deva who sees a young monk right after his bath in a, the river. He's standing on the bank of the river wearing only his underrobe. She's attracted to him. So she comes down and says, hey, you're wasting your time. Wait until you're old, then you become a monk. He says, no, I'm not wasting my time. I'm putting my time to good use. And there's a conversation back and forth between the two of them. And there's a lot of wordplay in the Pali. And she's confused. And so he offers to take her to see the Buddha. She says, well, I've never been able to get in to see the Buddha. The devas around him are too powerful. He says, well, I'll see what I can do to get you in. So she follows in his wake, comes to the Buddha. And the Buddha starts teaching her really high-level dharma, and she doesn't understand a word. Each time he gives her teaching, he asks her what she understands. At first she under says, I don't understand anything. So he brings the level of his teaching down bit by bit. And finally, again, he said something very very refined, very profound about the training of the mind. And he asks her, what do you understand? She says, well, I understand that giving is good, virtue is good. That's as, all she, as far as she was able to get. So you have to watch out for Davis like that. Sometimes there are devas who have a little bit of discernment, but it doesn't go very far. There's even the story of the great Brahma, the monk who in his meditation gains a vision of some devas. And so he asks them, essentially, where does the physical universe end? How far does it go? They say, well, we don't know, but there's another level of devas up above us. Maybe they know. So he meditates some more and gets to see those devas. He asks them. They say, well, we don't know, but there's another level above us. And so he gets sent up. It's like getting sent up through the bureaucracy. He finally gets to a very high level of devas and again asks them where the limits of the physical universe are. They don't know either, but they say, there is this great Brahman. Sometimes he will appear in a flash of light. And so if a flash of light comes to you and you see him, you can ask him. So finally, as the monk is meditating, the great flash of light comes, and there's the great Brahma. So he goes up to the Brahma and says, How far does the physical universe go? Earth, water, wind, and fire. And the great Brahma says, I am the great Brahma, nor of all, seer of all, everything that has been and will be. And this had been the book of Job. The monk would have said, Okay, I understand. You're much greater than I am. And would have left it at that. But this is not the book of Job. The monk says, that's not what I asked you. How far does the physical universe go? The great Brahma says, I am the great Brahma, nor of all, see of all, creator of all, father of all that ever has been and will be. The monk again says, that's not what I asked you. And finally, the great Brahma pulls him aside and says, look, I don't know. But my retinue here thinks that I know everything. It would be a great disappointment to them if they heard that I didn't know something like this. So he sends them back down to the Buddha. The monk goes down back to the Buddha. The Buddha says, you asked the wrong question. The question is, where does the physical universe find no footing? This is where he talks about consciousness without surface or consciousness without feature. So even the great Brahma has limits on his discernment. But this doesn't mean that the devas are all ignorant. There's another story about a monk living in the forest, goes down into a pond of water. There's a lotus in the pond, and so he bends over to sniff the lotus, and a deva appears suddenly and says, Look, you just stole the scent of that flower. And the monk basically says, Oh, come on. 
That's not stealing. So the Deva says, look, for anyone who really wants to purify his mind, even the slightest fault should appear as large as a cloud. You know, when they're talking about a cloud, they're talking about the cloud that covers the whole sky. And so the monk says, well, gee, I guess you're right. Thank you for informing me. And if you see me making any other mistakes like that again, please let me know. And the Deva says, look, I'm not your servant. You should look after yourself. And it disappears. So when you have visions like this in your meditation, and this doesn't happen only in Asia. I know people who, especially here in the Southwest, have had lots of visions going out to places like Bryce or Zion, around arches. Spirits of Indians, the coyote gods, a lot of the Native American beliefs. I mean, people have been meditating, or people are not Native Americans at all, and they, they see many of the same things. It's good to remember the basic principle for how you treat the devas. You recollect their virtues. You treat them with respect. And then you take what you learn from them and you put it to the test to see if it really is conducive to training the mind. And as for the recollection of the virtues of the day, that's useful. If you want to raise the level of your mind here in the present life, you don't have to wait to be, you become a deva. Although John Swat did make a statement one time. He says, when you're thinking about your next life, don't make a determination to come back as a human being. He says the human world is going to go through a lot of difficulties. It'd be better to come back as a deva. That belief that devas can't practice is not true. There are lots of devas who practice. They, if they get the opportunity to hear the Dharma, they can gain the noble attainments. But for right now, it's important to focus on those qualities right here. How do you make your mind a deva mind right now? It's through conviction. Generosity, virtue, learning, and discernment. That you can focus on right now, regardless of whether you have visions or not. And you find that it really does raise the level of your mind.